What's up, everybody? This is Professor Keegan, and this is a video for our second day in our unit three of this course, uh, the unit called Before Identity. Um, and, you know, if on the, on the first day in this unit, we discussed some of the contexts that determined how sex and gender were policed in the pre-colonial to early, early colonial period. So we talked about the establishment of sodomy laws um, to sort of like punish and stigmatize um, types of sex and gender that white European Christian settlers thought of as being savage. Um, today, we're going to talk about the period between 1850 and 1950, roughly. So we're kind of leaping pretty far forward in US history to talk about developments in kind of the second stage of the enforcement of sex and gender as the nation developed from um, a post-colonial, uh, pre-Civil War kind of situation where slavery was still legal, all the way up to basically World War II, which was only a century. Um, it was a really complex century, and we're only going to touch on some of the major shifts in sex and gender during this time um, before rewinding and thinking about the specific role that intersex people play in the history of the medicalization and pathologization um, uh, of, you know, the, the, the relationship medicine has with the LGBTQ community. Um, so... All that is to say is that we're still in the unit before identity. We're gonna be here for quite some time as we look at the period basically between 1500 and 1947 or so, um, which is a large stretch of time. So I'm starting out with this image of a person who would have been called a passing woman, um, a person who was assigned female but who uh, because of the way in which the country was opening up large areas of land that had been occupied by indigenous people who were forcibly removed, there were all these kind of frontier environments where lots of people could escape the lives they had been lead leading in their assigned genders. And um, passing women were uh, assigned female people who uh, ended up living as men in the Old West um, and often even serving in the military. And we're gonna hear the story of one of those people today. So, um, you know, this is not necessarily a, an identity category we would, uh, we would um, recognize today. Um, so, first of all, um, shifts in the control of sex and gender. Broadly speaking, we are talking about how there are these waves of systems that come in and start to assert control over how sex and gender are defined in the United States. Um, and last class, we looked at this specific wave, um, sort of like the early colonial contact period through the 19th mid 19th century, was really dominated by the discourse of sodomy in which non-normative sexuality was labeled uh, sodomy, which was uh, a sinful act according to Christian doctrine. And um, these acts were primarily punished according to a Christian kind of understanding of sort of the Old Testament. So some things that happened here were hanging, flogging, public shaming, excommunication from you know, being booted out of your community or your religious community or church. Um, and also death. Um, so there are pretty harsh punishments. Um, of course, as we discussed last class, not everyone who broke the rules was punished. Um, these um, punishments tended to fall on people who broke the rules of the social hierarchy and almost always on the person who was of lower status in that um, relationship. Um, so we talked a bit about this early period and um, how white colonizers put this system in place to kind of excuse the removal, uh, violent removal of indigenous people from their lands, as well as the sexual exploitation of sl African slaves. Um, then in the period we're gonna look at today, from between roughly 1850 and 1950, what happens is that as we talked about, uh, last class, there's the growth of a, of a cr national criminal legal code. Um, as the nation starts to really form, particularly post-Civil War, um, and integrate itself into a full-fledged nation state, 
um, we start to see overarching criminalization of certain kinds of sex and gender expressions. So in this context, we, we travel further away from the definition of sodomy as a sort of religious violation and toward a definition of crime, right? That these were crimes, you could be um, punished under the law for them at a, like, and nationally. Um, these spread throughout the nation. So um, now non-normative sex and gender is labeled as criminal rather than sinful and policed by new legal codes in the courts. And here we have as punishment, a new set of punishments, um, incarceration, fines, removal of rights, if you are a rights-bearing citizen, um, dissolution of marriages or estates, taking people's property away. So you can see here how it wasn't until really after the abolishment of slavery that we had a robust prison system in the United States. We've talked about this. Um, and so that prison system starts to be getting used to legally enforce um, the sex and gender system that white European settlers have brought with them to uh, North America. And then, and this is reserved for later in the unit, um, we will be looking particularly at this period beginning right around the post-war era, um, post-World War II period of the 1950s up until the present day. Um, Non-normative sex and gender are redefined again as scientific abnormality. And um, particularly by moder modern medicine, um, by psychiatry, by psychology, by sociology, um, and the punishment there is no longer um, religious or necessarily even legal by nature, but instead uh, there are all these cure logics applied to queer people like conversion therapy, medication, medical experimentation to try to find what, what makes somebody queer or trans, um, uh, forced sterilization. Um, so, and we will get to kind of the, the peak of this behavior is really in the uh, 20th century, but it, many of these practices linger today with us, particularly in the case of how trans and intersex people and, and cross-dressers are targeted by the medical industry. Um, so we are in roughly the middle section here and we're gonna be moving to the end later in this unit. Um, so for example, um, when we speak about like sex and gender starting to be policed by law, one of the things that's really interesting to look at is the spread of anti-cross-dressing laws across the country in the mid to late 1800s. Um, we know that sodomy laws were crucial to the initial subjugation of indigenous and African peoples. Um, once the nation was kind of colonized, we moved to a more legal structure where cross-dressing laws, like outlawing people wearing the dress of the opposite gender, um, were really key to policing social and political status in the new nation. So the country wanted to be very sure that women stayed in their place and could not um, pass themselves off as men, right? Um, the nation also wanted to be very sure that men were not appropriating female dress and, um, you know, acting as kind of like prostitutes to other men. Um, so there was an increased desire to control people's social mobility by locking them into certain kinds of dress. And we see that this develops um, in major cities. As cities are starting to develop and those societies are starting to become more complex, um, the nation is also really interested in kind of locking in the sex and gender system by controlling how people can appear. And this had a lot to do with race also, right? That the nation was very worried about uh, people of color passing as white and like voting or, um, you know, as being able to escape slavery that way. So cross-dressing starts to be a real point of anxiety and that's why we see all these laws on the books illegalizing it. Um, so uh, queer and trans, um, foundations for these ideas. As the reading discussed, um, what we would call transsexuality um, which is really kind of a, both transsexuality and homosexuality are both very 20th century words. Um, they have not really, or we could say queer and trans in our current um, context, have only really been thought of as separate phenomenon for about a century. So these are very new ideas. 
Um, and in earlier accounts of sex and gender variants, they were kind of blended into, um, my doorbell just trying, I apologize. Um, they were blended into like a, a, a category of where people were both sexually and gender variant at the same time. And so these didn't differentiate until um, a theory that sexuality and gender were different um, came along in the 1950s or so. So it was not until after a theory of gender identity separate from sexuality developed that a distinct term for trans people emerged as different from gay. Um, so it's really important that we, again, look at the forms of life in this unit as happening in a context in which gender and sexuality were not fully understood or thought of to be different. Um, that is a difference that is very 20th century in its context and something that gives us this modern idea of LGBT, where T is different from L and G and B, right? Um, um, that is not the case in this period. So for example, the term homosexual was not coined until 1869 to describe same gender attraction without cross gender identification. So these would be people who were attracted to people of their same sex category, but were gender normative, um, like masculine gay men. The idea before that was that sort of all people who are attracted to people of the same gender uh, category were also gender non-normative. So gay men would be acting as if they were women and gay women would be acting as if they were men. And we have really no longer, we've gotten rid of that idea. We no longer really believe that. Now we have an idea of gender identity, which is separate from one's sexuality. Um, the term transsexual, as distinct from homosexual, both terms today would probably be considered outdated and we don't use so much anymore. Um, both these terms um, come from the 19th century, um, but transsexuality does not emerge as a term until the early 20th. Um, so it's interesting to think of how some terms come later because of the terms that needed to develop before to then set up the development of a secondary um, term that follows. And we're going to look at this history some more next week when we look at how intersexuality kind of disappears once homosexuality becomes the dominant way of understanding um, sort of like sex and gender difference. Okay, so queer and trans, what are some major factors in their development? Um, in the reading, um, which is, we, we read 100 Years of Transgender History from Stryker's book, Transgender History. Um, she goes over four major things that needed to happen for this idea of queer and trans identity to form. And it was a centuries long process. So that's the other thing. We're still in a world where people are defined by their sexual acts, not necessarily by their identities. There was no sense of fixed sexual identity in this period, um, not until the late 1800s does that start to develop. So um, there are some big factors that need to come along to give us the kind of social and political climate in which something like a queer or trans community can form. The first of which is capitalism, ironically enough. So um, one big thing that needs to happen is that the development of wage labor and urban space um, like factories where lots of people who were unattached to agrarian family systems could come and live in community with one another and hang out and date and hook up, right? That didn't exist before um, the development of wage labor. Um, so that allowed a lot of people to move to cities. Mostly these were men, but there were women factory workers as well who lived independently from their prior family units and then we're able to develop alternative sexual and gender practices in these kinds of um, communities of sort of similar age, all one gender um, pockets of workers. So wage labor and factory work were really necessary and um, the development of urban space was also really necessary. Two, uh, American expansion and the frontier. So as um, indigenous people were forcibly removed from those lands um, by white settlers, uh, 
what happened was the U.S. government started giving out this land that had been indigenous land for very cheap because they wanted to populate the whole interior and western coast of the country with European people. And so they started handing out land under things like the Brace Act and the Homestead Act, um, where if you could get yourself out to this land and put down stakes, you could have it for almost nothing. And so a lot of white men seeking their fortunes went out to the West. And what happened was we ended up with communities where there were like 200 men to every one woman. And I mean, you do the math, right? <laughs> like this led to a lot of queer activity, particularly in the West. Um, many alternative sex and gender practices developed in that context, such as women um, kind of like assuming male identities and leaving behind their very suffocating Victorian lives for a life of adventure in the West as men. Um, single gender dances where men would dress up as women so that men were dancing with men, but some men would be like temporary women for the evening. Um, there were even um, same-sex marriages or long-term partnerships between people of the same gender in these contexts because it was so important to have um, someone else to split the labor on a, on a homestead and so few women around. Um, so all that is to say that the American frontier is, is a terribly violent place. It's a place of violent removal for indigenous people, and yet it's also this really experimental space when it comes to sexuality and gender. Um, then, also beginning in the mid-19th century uh, through, well, you could say the current period, but particularly on the issue of dress reform, the mid-20th, um, is feminism. And particularly first and second wave feminism, feminism's desire for women to have the opportunity to wear pants, which would have been considered cross-dressing, which was illegal. Um, so first and second wave feminists are lobbying state and federal governments to legalize and normalize women, female assigned people um, or women to be able to wear pants, which seems silly, but, you know, it hasn't been so long since this was normalized for women. Um, ironically enough, men have never gotten together and lobbied for the right to wear uh, skirts or dresses, and that's because wearing skirts and dresses is stigmatized in our culture. So, and pa wearing pants is not, because it, wearing pants is a traditionally male behavior. Um, so, you know, we know that this is a battle that these women won, but the person behind me, it would have been illegal for this person to actually adopt male dress in the way that they are in this picture. And then heading toward the end of this unit when we get there was the very important period of World War II, um, during which shifts in gender norms created what's been described as a national coming out period in which queerness and transness were publicly acknowledged for the first time in the United States. And that had everything to do with the war creating single gender environments where all the men were off fighting and all the women were home doing all the traditionally male labor. And in that context, a lot of people realized that they were actually queer. Um, and so that gives us the kind of coming out moment. And then that's why the 40s lead into gay liberation because a lot of people um, came out into a shared gay identity um, in the 1940s and 50s. We will get there. So major things we're going to be looking at as we move through the unit. Um, right, so I just described um, some examples of this would be pass passing women who lived as men often to one, escape the constrictions of Victorian womanhood, which were very repressive, um, or to marry other women, which they could not do as women, so they adopted male identities to do so. Um, some of them just wanted to lead independent lives, didn't want to be dependent on a husband and wanted to have their own work. Um, some of these people just preferred to live as male. Um, so you can see here that in a modern context, we might say, are these people lesbians? Are these people trans men? Um, are they just feminist women who don't like the gender constrictions of the time? It's really impossible to say, which is why we cannot, again, impose 
um, a monolithic understanding from our current period back onto these folks. This was a very socially and politically specific set of behaviors that people were engaging in to cope with a number of different issues. Um, I want to give you the story of one person um, who actually would have probably been a male identified female assigned person. So in our, our contemporary uh, understanding would have been a transgender man. I had you watch this for class, but I'll also replay it here. It's the story of Albert Cashier. Illinois. 1862, a 19-year-old named Albert stands waiting for a medical exam, hoping he won't have to undress. He has answered President Lincoln's call for volunteers to put down the Southern Rebellion. To join the Union Army, a person had to be able to march and run. You had to have a trigger finger and enough teeth to rip open a powder cartridge. You had to be a man. Though Albert started his life as a girl, his cropped hair and manner of dress raised no questions. He's healthy and able-bodied. That's all the examiner needs to see. He passes. Albert Cashier is now a member of the Union Army, one of the few transgender men known to have fought in the Civil War. At 17 years old, Albert crossed the Atlantic from Ireland as a stowaway. The ship carried him to his new life as a transgender man. Albert traveled west to seek adventure, and when the war broke out, he joined the Union Army. In the 95th Illinois Regiment, they called him Al, or Little Albert. These were his brothers. He fought in over 40 engagements with his regiment. He was known as a shy but scrappy soldier, sometimes even a reckless one. In the middle of one battle, Albert climbed a huge tree, dodging bullets to raise the Union flag. He made it through three years of service without injury, giving no one cause to question his gender. After the war, Albert settled in the small town of Sonneman, Illinois, where he marched with his fellow Civil War veterans in the yearly parade. He worked as a jack of all trades at the hardware store and on local farms. He taught the town children how to ring the church bells and lit the street lamps at night. In 1910, Albert was working as a handyman for his local senator when his boss accidentally hit him with his Model T, shattering his leg and his quiet life. Albert's gender was discovered by the attending doctor, but his boss, Senator Lish, stood by him and still saw Albert as the man he'd always known. He arranged for Albert's admission to a local soldier's home and promised him his dignity. After several quiet years at the soldier's home, Albert began to show signs of dementia. By now, an old man unable to speak for himself, he was transferred to the Watertown State Mental Hospital, where he was exposed as a transgender man. Without the support of his friends, he was transferred to the women's ward. The nurses forced him to wear a dress. Albert's story was leaked to the press and became front page news across the country. The federal government opened an investigation, charged him with identity fraud, and threatened to revoke his pension. Albert's brothers from the 95th came forward. His allies testified on their friend's behalf about his bravery and loyalty. Al was one of their own. He deserved to keep his pension. The court agreed. The case was dismissed and he kept his pension. But despite the protest of his friends and comrades, the hospital refused to remove him from the woman's ward. Albert fought against the dress and used safety pins to fashion it into trousers, but it made no difference. One day, Albert tripped on the hem of the dress and broke his hip. He never recovered. His comrades from the 95th gathered once more to make sure their brother in arms was buried as the man they knew him to be. Albert Cashier was given a full military funeral in the town cemetery, laid to rest in his Union blues. Albert's is just one of the many untold histories of trans pioneers who have lived, loved, and died in this country. We've been around. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay, and you can see that Susan Stryker, who is the author of one of the books we're reading, is actually was a consulting producer on this series, which covers um, trans history from across this this kind of full spectrum of like mid 18th to you know, almost up to like current present day, um, mid 18th century to present day history in the US. Um, so it's kind of interesting to think about Albert Cashier as an example of someone who did live across this period of, just to go back, um, this period from 1850 up until kind of transitioning over into how medicine started to have a very important role in the stigmatization of queer and trans people, right? Because you notice he begins by being able to be a man simply by dressing as male, right? Which was how gender was defined under, mm -hmm. under the kind of like 19th century um, idea of gendered roles. But then by the 20th century, when he is um, outed as, as trans, um, what happens is that he's, in, he's put into a mental ward, right? Which is um, kind of how medicine was starting to kind of def define queerness as illness. Um, and so we see a transition in, in kind of like which logic on which logic is determining like how queer and trans people are treated. Um, some other interesting examples from this period are people like um, Ellen and William Craft. You have to remember that people were also cross-dressing to escape slavery. Um, so slaves, especially female assigned slaves who were trying to get away from um, their slave masters were dressing as men. Um, or even dress, pa trying to pass as white men um, in order to get away um, to the north or to um, non-slave holding territory. Um, what's interesting about Ellen and William Craft is these are um, both enslaved people, but Ellen was very light skinned. Um, and so what she did was she cross-dressed as a white man um, and her husband, William, who was darker skinned, um, passed as her slash his um, uh, servant, black servant, right? And so we see how cross gender dressing and racial passing were both strategies that people who were trying to move between social statuses were using to avoid all kinds of punitive systems at this time. Um, yeah, especially to escape things like the Fugitive Slave Act, which meant that even if you ran away from slave territory, if you were caught in free territory, you could be taken back to where you ran away from, which was a law passed in 1850. Um, some other examples here, I mentioned um, same gender environments in the West. This was, this is an example of the, uh, the San Francisco, uh, inaugural ball in 1895 and you will see that this is all men dancing with each other. Um, so this is what we would call a homosocial environment, meaning um, single gender, not necessarily homosexual, but um, a single gender environment in which men are developing different ways of carrying out what we would call heteronormative practices by making some of the men into women um, through drag basically. And let's see here, we have, um, this is from Harper's Monthly. Um, it's definitely 19th century, mid 19th century dress reform movement in which women were agitating for emancipation from restrictive Victorian dress and the right to wear pants. Amelia Bloomer was, was um, a very famous part of this movement. Um, and that's where we get the name for these, these kinds of puffy pants were called bloomers because she was, advocating for them over these hoop skirts and corsets and things that were used to kind of control women's bodies. Um, so all of these forces are at work in the century that we're looking at 1850 to 1950. Um, you know, lots of people are strategizing about how to, how to survive under an increasingly complex set of legal and social prohibitions around gender and sexuality. Um, and then we will, by the end of the unit, arrive at the mid-20th century where we finally start to see the coalescing of a sense of shared identity among these different groups of what we would call queer and trans people. Um, 
And so some factors that we'll look at later in this unit are the McCarthy era, in which the anti-communist and anti-queer paranoia of that time um, created a public fascination with sexual and gender deviance. Um, and so this heightened awareness, particularly in the 1950s, of the potential for queer people to be anywhere um, and all of the sort of surveillance that pervaded the society to track and out queer people um, definitely fed into gay liberation. Um, there were also Alfred Kinsey's studies of sexual behavior, which were released in 1958 and 1963, as well as Harry Benjamin's book, The Transsexual Phenomenon in 1966. These are widely read by the public as well as medical professionals and really do revolutionize people's understanding of gender and sexuality. Um, so like the access to medical literature starts to um, break down the idea that straightness is natural um, and the only way people should be and that caused people to kind of freak out. Um, in 19, starting in 1959 and perhaps even earlier, because we keep finding more instances of this, um, we have a wave of riots at, um, in public spaces where queer and trans people are hanging out. Um, riots at Cooper's, Dewey's Donuts, and Compton's Cafeteria um, become some of the first politicized resistances to police oppression by queer people. Um, this escalates and culminates in the Stonewall Riots in 1969, which we'll be looking carefully at. And then, of course, um, that happens in late June of 69, when a crowd of working class queer and trans people at the Stonewall Inn in New York City resist arrest by the police. And that kicks off three days of rioting and begins the formal gay rights movement in the United States. So you can see how all this pressure that's building on the community in the post-World War II period is really what leads us to gay liberation as a movement. But it took a century from 1850 to 1950 for some of these um, gendered and sexual practices to develop in the first place before then a community, a politicized community could really form around the defense of queer life. So I will leave it there. Um, and um, I'll look forward to chatting you about with, with you about this material at our next live session.